God of War 2018 has no story. While there are events that play out from start to inevitable finish, an actual story has structure and it has purpose. So in the previous video I had referred to Sid Field's three-act structure, and there's an onus for me to justify even having used that as a baseline. At its core, the three-act structure is based on chiastic structure, beginning, middle, and end, with each preliminary point a reflection of an ancillary point. Why dramatic theory has upheld this structure is that the individual events are more impactful and they remain within one's memory. If a story has meaning, we are therefore convinced life itself has meaning. But if a story doesn't have meaning, we're left cynical after having partaken in its contents. The three-act structure is chiastic in nature, aiding in one's memorization of the events. In Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, for instance, there are patterns that simultaneously serve in both aesthetic and mnemonic functions. In other words, if one reads or even hears these stories read aloud, one will more easily be able to recall the basic structure of the composition during the performances. The story, the characters, and the overall meaning all render themselves readily within one's mind, but also within one's heart. And that is how stories ought to be. This is a major part of why one may recognize elements of New Gao, having been influenced by postmodernism. In other words, rather than use traditional methods of storytelling, utilizing classical structures and cadence to give the narrative a natural flow, the game just amounts to a series of and then this happens and then that happens in addition to a lot of didactics. Didactics to compensate for all this disjointedness. Some of these didactics may be found in the dialogue, but they're also injected in various moments of convenience that drop relevant plot-like information right into our laps before proceeding into the next series of events. And while I'll be talking about that here in general, I'll go into greater detail throughout this video series as it continues. Much of what the game intends to do is not tell you a story, but rather to teach you a lesson. The assumption is the player is like a child, and the developers are one's elders, trying to teach you whatever morals they deem necessary to make one, quote, better. Do not be sorry. Be better. The cycle ends here. You must be better. The developers are being patronizing. They're being preachy. You've had to kill people before, haven't you? You're used to it. We do what we must to survive. Animals I get. They're food. Draugr, they're supposed to be dead. But people, they're trying to survive too. Close your heart to it. On our journey, we will be attacked by all manner of creature. Close your heart to their desperation. Close your heart to their suffering. Do not allow yourself to feel for them. They will not feel for you. Now here's one such instance of didactics. Atreus pointedly talks about understanding the need to kill an animal, and not too long after he clearly felt remorse for doing so earlier. In other words, rather than let the hunt speak for itself visually, the writers have an instance here where they're basically telling the audience what that all meant. Note that the dialogue here has Kratos justifying the killing of people, which will very soon be rendered redundant because there will be an instance where Kratos and Atreus do kill people and Atreus is forced to. But really what these didactics show is that the audience is not to be trusted with coming to any conclusions on their own merit. Although our brains are working through the visuals and coming to their own conclusions, the writers want us to be told how to think about them through dialogue regardless. The problem with postmodern storytelling is that it borrows selectively from traditional or classic storytelling to sustain itself while its authors make a concerted effort to introduce something new to the table. But that endeavor will prove impossible in the long run, because there truly is nothing new under the sun. We must therefore rely on what stories have always done. Postmodern storytelling tries to change things up on a fundamental level, and so authors who try to unravel the fundamentals will find it necessary to rely on didactics, because the deviation from classic or traditional storytelling structures leaves one's audience in a natural state of dissolution and confusion. And the only way one's audience can therefore work their way out is to refer back to what the author told them, rather than what the story itself told them. Nobody cared about him anyways. What's the difference? There are consequences to killing a god! Didactics are, therefore, a method of telling one's audience how things ought to work despite the fact that the narrative itself doesn't support it. And that will be showcased far more dynamically when I cover God of War Ragnarok. But if one wants some examples off the bat here, I'll give two. One brief, but the other I'll go into a bit more detail because my goal in making these videos is to build on what elements actually do work, credit where it's due. 
My first example is taking Kratos' dialogue when he kills Balder at the very end. Dialogue which is clearly supposed to supplement for a lack of narrative drive to even kill Balder. But the writers want us to perceive what Kratos does here through his dialogue and not through the action itself. The cycle ends here. Must be better. There are any number of ways this situation may have been handled differently, but the finality of what Kratos says is the authors telling you that there was some kind of justification for the action, despite so many other things wrong with it. And I can also guarantee you that if people tend to justify exactly what Kratos does here for reasons given, it will therefore not be by merit of their own thoughts or feelings cultivated by the events of the game, but by merit of what Kratos literally says here. In other words, the audience cannot be trusted with their own thoughts, and so must be told how to think about this. Another example would be Atreus' sickness, and what's funny about that is Atreus being sick may have worked well as a baseline drive for the entire game. As I illustrated previously, the game's narrative may have been far more compelling if Kratos had been forced to trek up a mountain and retrieve a cure for his son. If the lies Kratos had been telling his son were the cause of his illness, then far better it would have been for Kratos to have discovered that piece by piece due the tax of the journey itself. Perhaps then Kratos reaches the top of the mountain only to have Atreus at the brink of death. At his wit's end, Kratos would then unburden himself of all his lies, telling his son everything. Thereafter, the antidote Kratos had been searching for reveals itself and Atreus is saved. But in thematic fashion, truth would have been the real remedy. Instead, however, we have didactics. Atreus' sickness is explained to us painstakingly by a number of characters who essentially ruin the mysticism of it. He doesn't know, does he? About your true nature? Or his own? That is none of your concern. This is no ordinary illness. The boy's true nature, your true nature, fights within him. The whole thematic value of a sickness based on Atreus' acceptance of a false premise is disrupted thanks to Freya and Mimir referring to it as if it's the most practical thing ever, with Freya even sending Kratos on another fetch quest to alleviate his son's most recent symptoms. And there are more details to go on about in that entire instance, but ultimately what I'm trying to do here is point out that the writers are not leaning as much into the thematic or symbolic portions of their writing so much as they want to straight up tell their audience how this all is supposed to to work and what it all means. That's what I mean about didactics. It's all about teaching rather than telling a story and letting the experience itself teach. Classic storytelling recognizes purpose, and a chiastic structure indicates that purpose. And so events occurring at one point in a story should be brought to bear later on in an action consequence fashion. Consequence, which also runs along the line of dramatic catharsis. If in one's story one tends to draw out events for too long or cut things too shortly, one's audience may tend to forget or dismiss details that are otherwise supposed to be important. And fundamentally, one's audience also wants to know that actions matter and that consequences are bound to follow. This is what gives one purpose. And as I get more and more into this game's events, I'll also show how the consequences are brushed aside. Here, however, I want to talk about world building for a bit. World building and story writing are not the same thing. I've made this point in other videos, but world building happens tautologically as a result of story writing. But world building in and of itself is not the same as writing a story. This is important to keep in mind because much of what supplements the padding in Nugao constitutes world building, but not true story writing. This is a major difference between my own predilections and the confused masses on YouTube who seem to believe that a good story needs copious amounts of world building to be worthwhile. But that's simply not true, and writers need not be compelled to hold themselves to such standards. Some have also noted that my rubric that I've applied here, the seed field structure, has the potential to reduce a great many video game semblances of stories to absolute nil. In which case, I will grant that is probably what this will do in the long run. And I do know that there are many aggregate websites and analysts who believe it appropriate to judge a video game medium by how it tells a story. But what's never come to bear in any of these judgments is what standard is being applied to any given video game's story. See, when any given person says story, what exactly should come to one's mind? Formatting, structure, acts, dialogue, rising action, falling action, catharsis, climax, etc, etc. Yet when I do play a video game, as much as I feel I must make a concession for standardized formatting, I'm constantly reminded of games that were also able to perfectly achieve their fit within an established format. 
Metroid Prime is an action-adventure game developed by Retro Studios and published by Nintendo for the GameCube back in 2002. The game was the fifth main installment in the Metroid franchise and the first game in the series to use 3D computer graphics and a first-person perspective. At a glance, the game appears to be a first-person shooter, but Nintendo specifically classified it as a first-person adventure, since most of the game is about exploration rather than combat. Like previous games in the series, the player takes control of the bounty hunter and series protagonist, Samus Aran. And the story follows her as she battles her old nemeses, the Space Pirates, Ridley, and all their Phazon-enhanced experiments on the planet Talon IV. Here, I will now endeavor to chart a three-act structure given the game's events. Act 1 begins with Samus Aran intercepting a distress signal from the Space Pirate frigate Orpheon, whose crew have been slaughtered by genetically modified experiments. It's there that Samus, and by proxy the player, discover the game's primary antagonist. And no, it's not Ridley. In fact, the primary antag is the highly radioactive super-organic substance known as Phazon. What follows is the inciting incident. Samus fights and defeats a gigantic parasite, but the resulting explosion will heavily impact her suit as she tries to escape. The damage severely impairs her advanced weaponry and tech. Note that that happens sometime after we encounter a newly resurrected Meta Ridley, who makes a surprise appearance and flees toward the nearby planet, Talon IV. And this will coincide with the story's first plot point. Samus is made to follow Meta Ridley and perform a more thorough investigation about what's going on. Act 2 begins, and its first half entails Samus exploring Talon IV. There she discovers the Chozo ruins and the remains of the ancient Chozo civilization. Throughout the game, you are encouraged to scan various objects to gain a better understanding of what went on on Talon IV. But one may argue even that's not essential in garnering a baseline understanding that the planet has certainly been ravaged by some great force. But the first half of Act 2 has Samus recollecting much of her old tech and abilities, scouring both the Magmore Caverns and the Fendrana Drifts alike. This whole mission to retrieve her tech can also be associated with a type of coming of age or rising to the occasion, a child becoming an adult. The story then reaches a pinch, indicated by the introduction of Metroids in a space pirate lab, but that's not necessarily the midpoint. The game's midpoint is when Samus makes a return to the remains of the Orpheon and journeys into the Phazon Mines. And note that the midpoint of a story is indicated by revelation that changes the course of the story. And what's remarkable about this game's story is the developers made the Orpheon both the start of the game and the midpoint of Samus' journey. At the Phazon Mine, Samus learns about the outcome of the Phazon experimentation project, including the development of Metroid Prime, a creature that had come to Talon IV with the meteor. And so Samus delves deeper into the mines and she fights through many Phazon enhanced pirates until she finally encounters the monstrous Omega Pirate. Second plot point is reached when Samus destroys the Omega Pirate. There's a brief scare where the Omega Pirate seems to crush Samus in the wake of its death, but there Samus arises anew and her suit has been corrupted by Phazon. Act 1 ended with Samus losing everything, while Act 3 begins with Samus having reobtained all her old tech, plus more. And as we continue into Act 3 proper, Samus then discovers that the artifact temple that Chozo built was in fact made specifically to contain Metroid Prime and stop the Phazon from spreading all over the planet. And thus all main driving forces of the story are brought to their most intense point, and the most dramatic of questions have been answered. Now much of Act 3 may be spent performing tasks commonly associated with Metroidvania, re-exploration of previous areas, and uncovering what could not be accessed before. And so Samus is made to collect a number of artifacts, all intent on gaining access to the meteor's impact crater. That entire endeavor builds into the game's climax. But even after placing all the artifacts, Meta Ridley appears and attacks Samus. And it's there the developers do something amazing by repeating the events of the game's opening. You see, Ridley's introduction heralded Samus' loss of powers back at the frigate in Act 1. And here, in Act 3, Ridley is brought back and intends on reversing whatever progress the player had made in collecting the Chozo artifacts. But he's also delaying the game's climax, which ought to provoke the player fiercely. And true, Meta Ridley only appears a select few times in the game. Yet he is a villain solidified in our minds simply because his very presence impedes the Act 3 transitionary period towards the story's climax. At this point in the game, we were desperate for a resolution, and Meta Ridley is all that stands in our way to achieving that. All this is to say that Meta Ridley is an ass, and the developers of Metroid Prime are geniuses for constructing the story in such a manner as to make his contribution memorable. 
if brief. Inevitably, however, Samus does defeat Meta Ridley and enters the Impact Crater, where she finds, fights, and defeats Metroid Prime. And there, the story really and truly does achieve its climax. Now, while this is a brief overview, a more in-depth analysis of Metroid Prime might see its Metrovania and covering even more significant chiastic structures within the game's story. But my rundown of the events here are solely to show how video games can and have built themselves on classic dramatic structures. This stuff can be done. Metroid Prime's story was built on a singular, if simplistic, purpose, finding and destroying Metroid Prime. And from there, every event in the game works to strengthen that focal point. And to that end, upon what purpose was New Gal built? To climb a mountain and scatter some dust? To be frank, this is not exactly the most compelling task that one could implement. Nothing about it shouts its worth as imperative. Disregarding the sentimental value the dust has, the task is downright mundane and begs the question what overarching purpose was being fulfilled in its completion, aside from personal satisfaction. This would be different if, say, there were some remedy that Kratos and Atreus were searching for, specifically made to save Atreus from his sickness, something they could only obtain by reaching the top of the mountain, and this would implement a life or death situation, and therefore would drive the characters and the player forward more urgently. And there, even upon reaching the top of the mountain and completing this quest, perhaps scattering the dust would be Kratos' final farewell to his wife, symbolically representing relinquishing his grief and finding closure. The way the game is written entails that developers wanted to have their cake and eat it too. As I've said before, the main quest lacks expediency, yet is undertaken immediately, all the while Kratos and Atreus are given a hefty amount of leeway to bring it to completion. And that'll feel strange in hindsight given Kratos was exceedingly worried about having a target painted on his back. The mundanity of the main quest also contributes to the difficulty of aligning Nugao's series of events with any semblance of story structure, given the ubiquitous detours alongside the main quest. And these detours are what would largely indicate the game indeed has no story. Kratos committing himself to this mission right now does not coincide with their latest issue, Baldur's Attack. And while Kratos does believe he has killed Baldur at this point, he still voices his fear that others may too come looking for him and Atreus. And because of all this, the natural course of action would be to deal with that situation before making plans to climb a mountain. And just as a reminder, this quest is not on a set timetable. So this entire setup is nonsense things continue to spiral out of narrative flow. Because the game's writers insist on their mystery box, many of the events are then tied together not by the journey itself, but by outrageous happenstance and conveniently revelatory information laid out at the last minute. The Light of Alfheim is just a tool made for proceeding from one area to the next, and it doesn't have any thematic relevance to what's going on with Baldur or Freya. The Magic Chisel is also a tool for proceeding from one area to the next, but neither does it have any thematic relevance to what's going on with Baldur or Freya. Now, Kratos' journey to Helheim to search for a cure for Atreus might have served thematic relevance to what's going on with Baldur and Freya, Except that at this point in the game, we still have no idea what drama has transpired between Baldur and Freya. And therefore, the potential parallels to be drawn between Atreus and Baldur, Kratos and Freya, are not capitalized on. The poetry is disrupted, the cadence falls, and all these fetch quests amount to the removal of roadblocks. Now, I know one might be arguing here that the game does draw these parallels. No. No, I would never Stay out of sight. This. Listen. You, you had no right. I had every right. I am your mother. You had no right, witch. I can't taste. I can't smell. I can't even feel the temperature of this, this room. Feasting, drinking, women. It's all gone. But you will never God. have to feel pain again. Death has no power over you now. You would rather die? Than never feel again? Yes. Rather than implement meaning through story structure, what the writers do instead is tell you that all this stuff has meaning. That's done through convenient character exposition, rather than done through a beat-by-beat -beat poetic experience. Freya is encountered by chance. She knows Kratos is a god for reasons. Kratos doesn't ask her how she knows. Freya also knows how to bypass the black smoke for reasons. And Kratos still doesn't ask her any questions. Also, Freya just so happens to know how the Bifrost works, for reasons, and Kratos still doesn't ask her any questions. 
Kratos and Atreus encounter Balder, Magni, and Modi during a crucial dialogue moment all by chance. Freya also knows exactly how Atreus' sickness works, for reasons. And she also knows exactly how to cure him, for reasons. Atreus suddenly becomes an arrogant SOB after learning he is a god, for reasons. And then he suddenly shifts back, for reasons. Kratos and Atreus then encounter Balder, conveniently in the middle of an in-universe flashback revealing everything that wasn't built up during the course of the game. This too is by random chance. But Kratos will have been made accountable for it as the game draws to a close. This is all what I mean when I say the game is utterly disjointed and unfocused. The game otherwise pads its length by giving the player a series of arbitrary detours lacking in any driving force other than to see them through for their own sake. For instance, Kratos and Atreus find Freya, just so happens to be Baldur's mother. But the pair of them only meet Freya by coincidence, not by any agency of their own. And so it may have been an opportunity to learn more about Baldur and establish a thematic parallel between him and Atreus it just turns into a random meeting with this Witch of the Wood. Freya keeps her identity hidden from Kratos, and he, in turn, does not ask any relevant questions because, once again, the writers want their mystery box. From there, a trek up the mountain takes another detour to find a MacGuffin, a side quest which is also taken up thanks to Freya making a serendipitous reappearance and letting Kratos know exactly what he needs to do next. So much for figuring things out on our own. But this is the kind of hand-holding that's rife throughout New Gao anyway. Zeus forbid we rely on our own thinking to see us through from beginning to end. And then when Kratos and Atreus eventually do climb the mountain, they come across Mimir. And that arrival synchronizes at a perfect, pivotal moment of ongoing dialogue where Baldur, Magni, and Modi unload all this pointed plot stuff. Again, the game does not give us revelatory information based on Kratos or Atreus actively looking for it. The game just dumps this stuff into our laps arbitrarily rather than build it into a cohesive narrative. Now from there, the game takes another detour where you're made to resurrect a recently decapitated Mimir. And then the game takes another detour where you have to find another MacGuffin, leading to another detour where you have to find yet another MacGuffin. What all this amounts to is a disruption of cadence, where the beats of the story are constantly being interrupted by padding. This is where one suspects the replayability of the game will lose its charm. These detours are not but a set of arbitrary roadblocks on the way toward the game's main objective. To compare this to Metroid Prime once again, realize that Samus would often be told where to pick up some new tech, or some weapon that would allow her to proceed into new portions of the game. But down the road, all these new weapons, visors, and suits Samus would pick up would all be built toward the final battle and all would be used as necessary and essential tools in defeating Metroid Prime. But for Nougao, a journey to obtain the Light of Alfheim, for instance, only serves to pad out the game's running time. There's no ulterior purpose to retrieving the Light, or in going on any of the other fetch quests to retrieve other MacGuffins other than this all achieves one's getting from point A to point B, etc, etc. In other words, it does not inherently contribute to the story. It's all made to artificially inflate the length of the game. Now, exceptions could be made if, say, Balder and Freya had more involvement, but they only factor in circumstantially, and there's nothing about searching for these MacGuffins that beckons anticipation for the game's climax. And I know one may argue that these details tours also give Kratos and Atreus time to bond, but even there, that would lead to the question how much time is actually necessary to achieve that. Moreover, all these detours make it impossible to determine where the game's midpoint is, if it has one. Beyond connecting the first half of Act 2 with its second half, the midpoint is supposed to be marked by a reversal or revelation that changes the course of the story. At best, one may grant that the midpoint occurs when Atreus is overtaken by his sickness, which leads to Kratos taking up the Blades of Chaos and journeying to Helheim and back. The problem there is that this sequence is completely detached from what was going on in the main quest. Once again, it shows how the writers want to have their cake and eat it too, the main quest having been put on indefinite hold while Kratos is allowed to attend to his son's onset sickness. In essence, this is just another detour to find a MacGuffin. Now from there, Atreus learns that he and his father are gods, and we proceed into a part of the game that, to be clear, has received its fair share of contention for what the game is worth. Atreus becomes exceedingly arrogant after he discovers the truth about himself. 
But this sudden change feels unnatural because there's been a complete lack of build-up to its occurrence. Note again, this is where tying Balder to more events along the course of the story would have worked. Perhaps if Balder had been featured more often, on top of being portrayed as far more charismatic, his cockiness would have rubbed off on Atreus, leading to the boy's desire to emulate the worst parts of his behavior. As things stand, however, nothing that precedes or follows it gives reason for Atreus' sudden shifting his behaviors. He will just as easily switch and then switch back. As events continue to transpire, Kratos and Atreus will find Balder in Helheim, and we see him drop some important plot details coincidentally as they are passing by. Nearly everything revealed or unveiled by the plot occurs just because Kratos and Atreus just happen to be in the exact spot they need to be at the exact time something relevant is uncovered. And you think of how effective this display would have been in light of a Balder that had been portrayed as far more charismatic. If Atreus had intended to emulate Balder's cockiness and arrogance, perhaps here he would have been convinced that the man was not at all what he seemed to be on the surface, and that something sinister and ugly lay hidden beneath. But there the intent behind structuring the story this way would be to continually maintain a thematic relationship between Atreus and Balder as wayward sons struggling with their respective parents. One can clearly see the semblance of this theme, but the writers never capitalize on it in any meaningful way. But even as we finally begin to solidify Baldur's identity and history, the game has all but begun to close. All that really stands in our way is yet another MacGuffin before we reach an ultimate battle with Baldur. But even this cannot be considered a climax in a narrative sense given Kratos never set out to solve Freya and Baldur's problems in the first place. He only did so incidentally to his own personal journey. In other words, the game did not build up up Kratos or Atreus' stake in anything that was going on in Midgard or the Nine Realms in general. And here Kratos decides to be judge, jury, and executioner based on a whim, despite whatever he says here. The we must be better sentiment is re-expressed, but the problem with that is still what sense of morality is being imposed? Where does this genocidal murderer from the South get off on telling others how they ought to conduct themselves? Particularly in light of the fact that Kratos himself still hasn't been punished for his crimes. Now I'm getting ahead of myself here of course, but ultimately the point of this video was to give a baseline understanding as to how disjointed New Gao is, and therefore prove how it has no structure and therefore no story. And from here on out, I'll endeavor to cover all these things in far more expanded detail. Beyond that I also want to thank the following, Legacy, Gingham and Prime, and Ken Kaneki. You've all been extraordinarily helpful in solidifying my own thoughts and feelings about this game, and for that, I am extremely grateful. And for all my viewers, if you want to help invest in my content, give the video a like and subscribe to my channel, Rusty Cheese Knife. I also have a Patreon, and I use Cash App, both of which function like online tip jars. For my viewers out there, I want to thank you all for watching, and I recommend you stay tuned for more content down the road. Until next time... Sounds like something the forge would.